OTB's The Hurling Pod with James Skell and Paul Murphy. People of Galway, we love you! I don't want to leave the people of Waterford down, you know, because they're my life, you know. People of Waterford are my life, you know, and I, 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 love, I, love, I love my county, you know. We love John it's almost like they're afraid to kind of mm. go and hurl and yeah. just let themselves express themselves. They're, it's like as if they're nearly afraid to make a mistake and sometimes you have to make a mistake and just throw off that bit of nervousness and have a go. Yeah, it's pure constipated hurling. Welcome along to episode 19 of the Hurling Pod. It is ahead of semi-final weekend in the All-Ireland Hurling Championship. Clare will be hoping to beat Kilkenny in the Championship for the first time since 1997 when they clash at Croke Park on Saturday evening. And then we've got a repeat of the 2018 decider on Sunday afternoon where the reigning champions Limerick will go up against Henry Shefflin's Galway. For John Kiley's side, it will be a chance to reach a third successive final for the first time since the 1930s. But they go up against a Galway team who already beat them in the league earlier this year. Two mouth-watering games to look forward to. Delighted to say that we've got Paul Murphy and James Scahill alongside me to look forward to what's going to be a bumper weekend at Crow Park. Lads, how are you getting on? Great, how are you lads? Very well, how are you? I'm, ex- I'm excited about this weekend. I was at the football quarterfinals weekend just gone by. Uh, we had one really good game uh, between our man Galway, which goes down as a bit of a classic, uh, even if people want to concentrate a little bit today after the brawl that happened at the weekend. But the game itself was fantastic. It was really exciting. The other three games weren't as exciting. They were all won by big margins. So, I'm very hopeful that we're going to have two really good games of hurling this weekend. And I actually think it's really well set up, James, when it comes to this weekend. Because we haven't had Kilkenny against Clare for such a long time. We mentioned it last week. Brian Lohan was on the pitch in 2006, the last time these teams actually met in the championship. So it's been a long wait for them to meet. Yeah. And that kind of novelty just adds to the intrigue, I think, going into Saturday as well. Yeah, I, do. I, think, so. I think the two teams are at a different stage, obviously in the sense that the Kilkenny were probably at the peak of their powers when they met last and Clare were probably declining a bit to be honest you know, coming down from I suppose even 97 coming up and then probably on the way down with some of their elder statesmen heading towards hanging up their boots to be honest uh, whereas right now they're just full of energy they're full of flamboyance and they've got all their big players playing playing really well and that's why I said last week but I'm really intrigued to see how this fixture pans out because Kilkenny are probably you could class them as the ultimate tacticians for big games um, so the last time you find that they, when they went up against a uh, I suppose a superior uh, opposition was the Limerick one in 2019. So it'll be interesting to see how they plan for Clare. Tough one. Um, there's probably only going to be a point or two in it. Very difficult to call. And I'm just really excited to see the likes of Tony Kelly go back to the You know, it's been a while since he was there. See what he uh, what he throws out and how Limerick uh, or how Kikini, should I say, are going to manage him. Yeah. Um, John Kiley, six seasons now as Limerick manager. They've played 29 games. They've only lost five along the way. Two of them were against Kilkenny in championship and we go back to that 2019 semi-final so um, Paul when you look forward to this game is this the type of one that Kilkenny will relish because a lot of the talk this week is probably going to be about how well Clare have played so far this year Kilkenny have lost more games in the championship this summer than Clare have Clare probably considered you know favourites going into the game at the weekend are Kilkenny waiting to try and derail the train that uh, the banner are going to come with yeah, like Kilkenny will obviously focus on themselves, but they'll enjoy the narrative, I suppose. Um, you know, just speaking from experience, anytime we were going into these kind of matches, um, again, you mentioned 2019 against Limerick, where no one's really expecting you to win. Um, players, certainly in the Kilkenny camp, wouldn't look at, look at that as, oh, we have a free shot, and so for bet, it's okay. They'd look at it more from the point of view of, wouldn't it be savage if we turned them over and we, we leave Crow Park on Saturday evening? Nobody knows what's after happening. We're into an All-Ireland final and we're the first team into an All-Ireland final. That's the way these lads will be looking at it. It won't make any difference to them that Clare are marginally the favourites probably for this. Like It really is a 50-50 game, being honest. But I suppose you talk to the neutral, it's probably a bit more leaning towards Clare in terms of the matches they've had and the way that they're, you know, I suppose they're trending at the moment. They're in an upwards trend. But uh, look, Kilkenny will love it. Kilkenny will love coming in this way. There's a good vibe around Kilkenny at the moment. Um, I think the players, you know, winning the Leinster final again when they were... Galway were tipped to win it you know that that means a lot to these players as well because they continue to kind of I suppose book the trend of what the critics are saying so it's look at the match Kilkenny and Clare is ideally teed up at the moment really because Clare bandwagon is up and running and the support is huge they'll bring an enormous support there on Saturday and they're hurling really well you know I've really enjoyed watching the Clare games so far this year they just play a great brand of hurling Uh, and then you throw Kilkenny into the mix you know 
they when it comes down to the crunch they've won the games they needed to win they they're well able they're happy to grind it out when they need to grind it out and they have the players that will you know close out a match when they need to close it out so it's just so finely balanced at the moment that i think you know it's it, it's a mouthwater match and then that's before we even get on to limerick and galway on on sunday Murph, can I bring you back to 2019 a bit, just about the preparation for that game? Because Limerick were overwhelming favourites against you guys that day because they'd won the All-Ireland the year before, they'd been impressive in the league, impressive in the Munster Championship. There's the feeling that this was a team who were going to go on with the success that they have had since, albeit 2019 they lost in the semi-final. But Kilkenny came out with tremendous intensity, hurled so well in the first half of that game, uh, seemed to kind of shell-shock Limerick a little bit. And then we're able to hold on and get the victory at the end and go to that All-Ireland final in 2019. What was the mentality within the camp about going into that game where for the first time probably in a long time, Kilkenny were actually considered underdogs going into a semi-final? Yeah, the, I suppose the narrative straight away once once we bet Cork um, in, in the quarterfinal, the narrative after that was this, this is just completely a step too far. Like there was, I don't think you would find anyone before that game um, even a lot of people in Kilkenny w- wouldn't have tipped us at all. Uh, even speaking with their hearts, they wouldn't have given us give us a chance to win that match. So really, from from our camp in the run into that game, it was we weren't even looking at it as a free shot. We were just saying this is going to be savage. Let's come out of the tunnel in Crow Park, and Limerick won't even expect what we're going to hit them with. And I think that's really what we did. Um, like there was there wasn't I suppose an area on the pitch that we didn't win that day. The uh, certainly in the first half anyway you know and then Limerick came into it again in the second half the goal like the penalty that Aaron Galan won um, just before half the time kind of kept Limerick in touch and they were just closing and closing and closing but like it was a real performance for us that day that once we saw how we started I think we got the first two scores and it took a while for Limerick to get a score and Limerick were kind of cagey then um, when Colin Fenley got the goal Adrian Mullins point where the four lads tackled Tom Morrissey on the sideline and turned it over like what all those things did was build huge momentum for us the crowd got behind us because they weren't really expecting us to put in such a performance and what that happened is like and this will be symptomatic of both games this weekend you know it's one game and if you get the momentum at any stage in the match and you keep that momentum you could win it like a team could win either game now between like the 40th and 50th minute if they get this kind of a if, if they nearly make the other team punch drunk from just hitting them with something that they weren't expecting really i suppose galway are teed up this weekend that if they come at something but i think i just think limerick are kind of well worn for galway as well because we weren't i suppose um we weren't as tipped coming into this match. Like, There's a few people that fancy Galway could really put it up to Limerick, but we were a little bit further back from that in 2019. So like, what that does is, I think Limerick have learned their lesson from the likes of losing those games. Um, but the lesson in that is that the semi-final, you know, you can prepare for it and you're really aware that this is a really big match. But if you're just off by 1% or 2%, which Limerick were that day, you leave the door open for a team just to dominate the game. And regardless, if you find, if you find you're getting your feet back into the match, you may have just not done enough to get yourself over the line then that you may have just left it too long so all over like this 70 minutes there's no room for error for for any team this weekend so look our preparation into that game was just if we win this one match that no one's expecting us to win we're in an all-ireland final and that and someone's year is over someone else's year is over limerick in that case so that's what the way all four teams should be thinking and just have an, an enormous savagery going into these games this weekend yeah, we'll look at both games in detail, James, in a few moments. But what is the feeling in Galway at the moment about this game against Limerick? Because, again, like we talk about how long it was between meetings for Kilkenny and Clare going into this weekend. Well, for championship meetings between Limerick and Galway, um, you were there in 2018 in the All-Ireland Final when Limerick came out 316 to 218 that day. 2020, very close game in the pandemic year where Limerick won by three points and mm. injuries played their part in that game too, 27-24. But actually, Galway and Limerick had met very infrequently in championship in the period before that. You go back to 2005, uh, when Galway won in the second round of the qualifiers against Limerick. And then you have to go back to the semi-final from 1981, when Galway got to the final, uh, to get a championship meeting between Limerick and Galway. So they're rare enough. We've had two in recent years where, truth be told, it's been incredibly close between Limerick and Galway on both those days, both two years ago and back in 2018. Yeah, and I think, I suppose, when you go back towards those fixtures... Like the the turnaround in players differs greatly in Galway than it was in Limerick. So I was I was just writing down and say how many of the Limerick team let's go back to the twenty eighteen final are playing and probably all fifteen of them are available. How many of the Galway team will play? Probably nine, maybe ten will start. So there's been a turnaround in Galway and we're we're going through. I won't call it a transition to say, but we're trying to blood in a few younger players and get players who wouldn't have been on the 
on the radar as much over the last couple of years into the system. And I think in Galway, it's, it's you've got it's kind of fifty fifty really. You've got the optimists who believe that Galway are going to win every day, you know, and you've got the pessimists who are looking at Limerick and think they're an unstoppable force. And for me myself, I'm looking at this in a very similar sort of mindset that we that I was in back in 2012 when we, before we played Kilkenny in the Leinster final. And I suppose Kilkenny then were were the Limerick of now. You could say they were in the peak of their powers and. We just we we didn't focus on Kikini as such. We focused on ourselves and just, just getting out of the traps as hard and as fast and as physical as possible, and win the first ten minutes. Forget about the results. Forget about half time. Forget about possibles, probables. Just get the first ten minutes and hit them with everything you have, and then see where the game takes you. Because if you can sustain the first 10, 15 minutes, then you'll see what, how the game will peter out. But if you get you know sucker punched for an early goal or a couple of goals or things don't go away in the first two minutes sometimes it sucks the life out of you so that's the way i'm looking at this game from a goalie perspective yes i'd say we're up against it we're probably meeting you know the best team that's been seen over the last you know 10 years so it's a case of do exactly what i said focus on yourself go after them with absolutely everything you have and see where the first 10 minutes takes you and when you get beyond that 10 minutes focus on the next 10 minutes and just play little mini games inside and forget about names forget about what they've done in the last couple of years forget about who they have on the sideline or forget about the crowd that they bring. Just focus on yourself and attack, attack, attack. That's the only way I see Galway going after this. And it, it, I said last week it's a free shot. And look, it's, that was probably wrong of me to say it because it's a semi-final and they're there for winning. So from for, if I'm in that dressing room with Galway at the minute and I'm saying to the teammates, just, I'm sorry, fuck everything Limerick are doing. Just go after Galway and hit them with, with everything you have and see where you are after the first two minutes. I mean, the story. Galway Limerick met as we were back in the Gaelic grounds. I think it was our first podcast back in February. It was actually the week after that meeting where Galway won by six points on the day. Now I appreciate league is a long time ago, and I appreciate yeah. that league form went out the window when it came to championship. But is there a bit of a template, James, coming into this, given the way that Galway played? Because we remarked at the time on the intensity with which Galway came out, the physicality which they did, getting into Limerick's faces uh, during the game too. Is there a bit of a template, though, for taking on Limerick that we saw at the Gaelic Grounds, albeit way back in February? Yeah, you, you were saying the Gaelic Grounds. I, I would kind of say a bit of a template, yeah, but I think there was more of a template probably offered in QC Park and Innes as to the way, the way Clare approached it. I think you you don't want to give Limerick possession, let's say, within their, within their own half so they can build it up. Try and make them go along. So pack, pack them out from up the front. So I wouldn't like to see Galway deploy a sweeper from the off. I would like to see them go six on six up front and get tied up on their backs and just make Limerick go along and see see can you win a dogfight down the back of your own side. Um, in, in terms of the Gaelic Grounds game, like I, I would never say Galway would be, would be wanting from a physical perspective. So like when you're looking at all the avenues that where Limerick really get on top of teams, you'd say physicality is number one. But automatically, I'll say we can we can I won't say neutralize it, but we can certainly match it. Can we exceed it? That's a different proposition entirely. But we can match it. And then it's just what Limerick are doing so good is just they're tactically very good. Their hurling speed and hurling sharpness is exceptional, uh, to be honest. And the, their ability to get quality ball into the likes of Galen and Flanagan, where you see Flanagan on the ball. Christy Connor wrote a fantastic article last week about the amount of time he was on the ball to get his eight scores. When you contrast that with the, what with the kind of work Connor Whelan has to do with the ball, he's kind of getting at the minute. We're just we're not probably at the same level there. So that's where I see a big difference. But like physically, we'll front up. Yes. Um, I think we need to attack their puck out big time. We need to get on top of Nicky's puck out because they'll certainly, they will certainly do that to us. Um, which, as I said last week, is probably a slight area of concern. And then it's down to the sharpness and tactical play. And I think if you're looking at the four teams in the semi-finals, you know, I'd be I'd be dishonest if I was to say that Galway are not fourth in in the form. You could say you you would say Limerick, uh, Clare and Kilkenny are probably producing better form, better performances, and like we. Look, we kind of limped through the quarterfinal, to be honest, but we're still here. So the quarterfinal is done. So I'm looking back at all those games, and you can account for form. But Murph said it: it's one game, just one game. You know, attack their puck out, make the middle third an absolute and utter war zone. Hit everything that moves. You know, within the rules of the game, obviously, to a certain extent, right? Hit everything that moves, and you've got to take your opportunities. So we won't get that many opportunities. Limerick have only conceded three goals in the championship so far. So if we're to beat Limerick, we're going to have to score, in my view, a minimum of two, if not three goals, to get over them. Like, and they've, they've only scored five themselves, five or six. So, But for us, for a team who doesn't have the shooters and doesn't have the 50 shots like Limerick have, we've got to get two, three goals, which is a seriously difficult proposition when you think Sean Finn is probably going to take up Conor, Conor Whelan, who's been our main guy. So you're looking at others to, to produce the goods. We can't be dependent on Conor because he's been doing it for the last couple of games. He's like... He's like being our sole forward up there, producing moments of magic from very difficult angles. He's scoring points that are ridiculous. So that kind of level of difficulty, 
it won't work every day. We've got to get more out of the Tom Monahans, more out of the Joseph Coneys, the Cotton Mannions. So them boys are going to have to come up with multiple scores if we're to be in, in with the chance. Um, Paul, we don't often do quizzes on the hurling pod, but here's one for you. Let's have a look at the numbers. So the straight knockout system uh, finished out in 1997. And so we look at, say, the modern system of the semi finals since then. So since 97, who would you reckon has reached more All Ireland finals? The Leinster champions or the Munster champions? I'd say Leinster champions. Sure, it has to be Leinster. Right. You know, Kilkenny doing the damage here. When you say Leinster champions, most years it's been Kilkenny. Uh, Leinster champions, so since 97, have won 17 of the semi finals that they've played, losing eight, drawing two of them. Uh, the Munster champions, by contrast, win 11, lost 14, and drawn two. And it was interesting that the Munster champions actually had a very bad run of coming through after winning the Munster championship in the seven years 2012 to 2019. They lost seven of them in those years and just one win for the Munster champions. So uh, Tipperary were the only team 2016 when they went on uh, to the All-Ireland final after winning the Munster championship. So remarkable how, you know, even Limerick, you go back to 2019, they were also Munster champions 2013, lost their All-Ireland semi-final. Cork lost three in that run and Tipperary lost two others. So um, sometimes we talk about, you know, the strength of Munster hurling and we talk about, you know, coming out as Leinster champions. Uh, one wonders if that's going to be an advantage for Kilkenny. Generally, it seems, lads, it's better to come through as the provincial winners than to come through from a quarterfinal or from the qualifiers. Since 97, 28 times out of the 49 games that have been played, the win has been for the provincial champions in the semi finals. So it would seem on. on the back of it, Paul, that we talk about managing the break and maybe it's better to have a game like we saw with the two teams a couple of weeks ago. But it seems being provincial champions is actually advantageous going into a semi-final. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, we've asked this question quite a bit um, or even would be as a player, which do you prefer coming in through quarter-final, having an extra game or going straight to the semi-final? I think everybody hands down and says straight to the semi-final because... First of all, freshness, you know, you have that perfect time. And, like, this is really a perfect time. If you look at the likes of Kilkenny, you know, four weeks off, that's ideal. You have a week kind of recovering, getting lads back going. Um, the following week can go hard at training. You can get a weekend away, maybe two weeks before, which probably every team does get a bit of, you know, look and analysis and different things, look at a bit of videos. Um, and then you're kind of winding down coming into the match. So it's, it's the perfect time. I think I remember going back to 2013, I remember talk around then, I remember Limerick lost it after winning the Munster final. I think they had about a six-week one, which is maybe, some could argue, is a little bit too much, if I'm right in saying that. I think it was around six weeks, because that was that was a lot of the talk back then. But, you know, four weeks is perfect. Um, but, see, the thing is, it's, it's, it's a funny one, because either way, like, let's say Kilkenny and Clare play the weekend. Kilkenny win, people say, it will come through to provincial. Sure, they, they didn't have the extra match, and Clare, you know, after having the extra match, it maybe took it out of them against Wexford. But if, if Clare do win, they'll say, well, the extra match helped Clare, you know, they had the extra match. Kilkenny were off since Galway. So, like, the narrative kind of depends on who wins the game. But certainly, from my point of view, like, I, I always preferred... You know, go the direct route. Your confidence stays up. Like Kenny will have their confidence still up after um, the Leinster final. You know, they'll have a chance to have a look at all injuries and get the recovery right. Um, whereas, you know, Clare just don't have that that time. And likewise for Galway um, going in against Limerick. Any team, any of those four teams would rather go the direct route because you just, you save yourself that extra match and the potential that the likes of Garrod McInerney picking up an injury there. You know, is he right or is he out and so on. So you just risk adding injuries by going the indirect route into the semi-finals. James, is there any words on McInerney? Now, I'm very mindful we asked you about Conor Whelan earlier in the year in the pod and you went, oh, no, no, definitely out with the weekend, not going to play. And then, you know, he was added to the panel on the day to play. So um, there is that. You're going to play this down and not give anything away to our Limerick uh, listeners. But is there any word on, on McInerney and how close or far away he might actually be? Uh, tr- this is the truth now. I'm mm-hmm. not lying, right? But I haven't heard much. But initial initial assessment was that his knee's not good. Okay. So I, but I don't know. Is that does that constitute a tear in the ACL, limb ACL, or a sprain? But from from what I'm hearing, it's it's not good. Okay. You never do know. Unfortunately, I mean, <laughs> it was a bit like the Dublin footballers last week when kind of the news is breaking that there were muscle injuries to both James McCarthy and to Conor Callan. You kind of wait all week to see if they're going to be fit, and it was only at the point on Saturday afternoon when the programmes were being handed out to us at Crow Park that you realised. Quick look down through the 26. Right, no sign of the two boys. They're definitely out, and then that mm. becomes a concern for them at that point. We spoke about it a little bit last week, James, about what happens potentially if McInerney is not there. Is it just a straight slot? of Joseph Cooney back into the number six shirt and that's the most sensible thing to do? 
Yeah, I th- see. I thought more about this as the podcast was over last week, mm. and I was thinking you're moving an awful lot of your pieces around. To, of course, Murph is laughing there because he knows <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking too deeply about this. You know, <laughs> it occupied a full day of my week last week. But I was thinking, God, like, who do you want at number six? Do you want a smart hurler um, who can contest high ball, get forward, shoot, and connect the play? So I said, maybe it could be logical to put David Burke back to six, who's very clever, you know, and possibly leave Joseph Cooney up in the forwards. Then you wouldn't be robbing your puck-off strategy, um, and I think you'd, be, you'd have a good guy in place for Mac. Then you're bringing in the likes of a, probably a Ronan Glennon to a midfield slot, or some, something of that sort. So I just think if you bring back Joseph Cooney, it's, hard, it's harder to replace Joseph Cooney in the forwards than it is to put in another midfielder because we have midfielders available to be honest and I think the, I think our squad depth is it's kind of young you know like we we don't have a, we have a couple of season campaigners you could say but they will come on so that's three kind of of the five spots occupied and the other two then will be for young guys you know the likes of the Gavin Lees who's doing the leaving circle and whatnot. so I think Joseph Cooney leave him in the forwards and I would put David Burke back into back and then plug a hole in midfield but again what will probably happen <laughs> is this the opposite Joseph Cooney probably goes to six or seven and Park Manning was in there but again either way uh, it's it's Mac is a big loss because he is so physical so physical so anyone comes with the middle there will be will be met with a bit of ferociousness but again that's that's uh, that has to be provided by everyone so even though he's missing the rest of us have to step up mm. James I'll give you the first of the listener questions because it brings us round on the discussion of this which is Daniel Diskin has asked what is Henry Shefflin's main focus going to be in preparation for the Limerick game at the weekend um, I think his main focus is his own team to be honest I think if you're focusing like winners focus on winning like you know losers focus on winners so I think we should be just focusing on ourselves you know focus on ourselves getting our own house in order and uh, prepare for as much as you can in the sense that that's, e- it's, it's, that's an easy phrase for me to throw out here prepare, prepare for everything prepare for expect anything to happen you know what I mean and I'd be, I'd be preparing for the first 10 minutes and just to go at them as hard as we can and maybe throw something different at them. They're all expecting Conor Whelan to be inside. So, you know, could we could we see him in the half forward? Could we see him centre forward? Could we see a, a traditional fifteen on fifteen like all we haven't been doing recently? And again, just just focus on yourself. Get your own mindset right. Um, if anything at all, you can't improve your hurling that much in, since the since the Cork game. You can't improve your fitness that much since the Cork game, but you can improve your mindset. So if it is anything at all, just get the boys battle hardened, ready to rock, and uh, ready for war. To be honest, you know, and nearly nearly convince them convince them they're going to win do you know what I mean now that's easy for me to say right but it can be done like good leaders can convince a team like you're going to win no matter what happens so focus on the mindset and uh, that brings you a long way to be honest yeah I think Paul this doubles up with another question we got on the Instagram from Cor- Cormac Morrissey as well who said how much of a chance to go we have against Limerick it's almost the same as the question about what Henry needs to focus on for them to win what do you think Galway have to do to try and answer the two lads questions at the same time if they're going to overcome Limerick on Sunday afternoon well, um, look, the, the, the fact that they're playing Limerick, I think actually clears a lot of the bullshit from the mind of the Galway players because they know exactly the task that's at hand. And that can be a real positive in lots of ways because, you know, you go into, let's say Galway went into the Leinster final, you know, they're, they're kind of tipped going into it and some, sometimes being the, the tag of favourites can maybe affect some players. Um, maybe, like, you know, you have a lot of tactics going on. Who knows? There's lots of things that can muddle a player's brain. But when you're going out against Limerick, like Limerick could beat you in the first 10 minutes it could beat you in the first 15 minutes and ideally any manager wants to have their players focused and get a good start like they're nearly cliches but like you know first 10 minutes lads don't look past it the one thing about playing Limerick is it actually focuses the mind that you you know you have to play first 10 15 minutes like Henry will be telling his team like if you're under any doubt you have to win every single position and never mind win your own position you have to help the lad beside you win his position because that's what Limerick do He's going to be telling his players really, like, because it is the only way they have a chance of beating Limerick, is that play like you're not even trying to play to meet to make the end of the game physically. That you're just going to go as hard as you possibly can, take every challenge and play every single ball. And sometimes when you tell a player, you know, lads, win every play every ball as it comes. Don't think about thirty minutes, forty minutes. You know, just play every ball. Sometimes that goes in one ear and out the other with players, but. That's really what Limerick have to do, or sorry, Galway have to do. They have to fight for every single ball and hit Limerick with something that maybe Limerick aren't expecting. And that's a slight maybe. I think Limerick are well warned what Galway are capable of. But they have to break that system for Limerick. Now, the difference of when we played Limerick in 2019 and when Galway are playing them, um, 
Limerick ha- didn't have the system fine-tuned then for when a player gets isolated to pop the ball off. Like We see Limerick now, when they win the ball, let's say you know Kyle Hayes wins the ball at wing forward, you know it's very hard to isolate him because often he'll have Tom Morrissey off the shoulder, he might have William O'Donoghue behind him. They didn't have that fine-tuned when they played us, so we were able to isolate them. So the big thing for Galway now is, you know, okay, let's say Aaron Galan wins a ball. You need Aaron Galan's marker to be right in on top of him and you need the lad then let's say the next Galway player shutting off the passes that are off the shoulder that's a huge thing because they have to shut that down win that ball and they're going to need an arm, enormous performances like kind of inspiration yeah. performance from the likes of Dahi Burke and Davy Burke and these lads who can do it they need leaders to really step up here because it's not a case of that anybody around the pitch can have a mediocre performance and win they're going to have to win every single position um, but I really think Henry is just going to have them tuned to say listen lads if we have any chance to win this game first 10 15 minutes we have to be a juggernaut on this pitch we have to absolutely hit them with everything and sometimes in matches that can go on deaf ears you know you can say that in a dressing room and it's just lost but this sunday more than ever it's important for galway to in the first 10 15 minutes and the last thing i'd say is don't let Connor whelan be isolated at full forward that's a that's a problem that galway could have and we've seen it in some games where he gets isolated and they're feeding balls in. And if they feed balls into an isolate, isolated Conor Whelan, we see what he can do when he's man-on-man man with his own player and he's 50-50 ball, he'll win it. He'll win the 60-40 ball, he'll win anything. But if he's isolated inside and you know he has Sean Finn breathing down his neck, he's Barry Nash and all these lads, there's only so much he can do. So they need to make sure that as hard as they're working out the pitch, when they're getting that ball in towards Conor Whelan, he needs to have supporters there as well for that to be the launching pad for them scoring. James, yeah. we saw... Perfect. Poor shot efficiency be a massive problem for the Mayo footballers at the weekend when they were playing against Kerry. Poor shot efficiency was a big problem the last time that Galway went to Croke Park when they were playing that Leinster final. Are you thinking that Galway are going to be better with their shooting in front of goal based on the evidence of what we saw against Cork? Or is that a concern coming into this game against a Limerick team who don't tend to cough up too many easy chances in front of their goal? You usually have to work for every score you get against this team. Yeah, there's a couple of things, Will, because I like first of all, I think the Galway boys are going to be put under uh, substantially more pressure uh, against Limerick than they, they were against Cork. Um, how many opportunities they get, it's very hard to tell because the Limerick defence is just so so good. You know, they're all, all of them are all-stars. Um, what I want to see from Galway, if I, I come to shot efficiency in a second, is mm. I want to see the players want the ball. You know, so when things are going well in the game and you're up a couple of points, every lad wants the ball. Every lad wants to be in on the action and get their name on the score sheet and get a bit of a highlight. But when things are going against you, sometimes players, and Galway are guilty of it, to be honest, sometimes they kind of go into their shell a bit and they'll wait for somebody else to do it. You know, or maybe Conor Cooney will do it, or Conor Mennion. But I'd like to see the 15 or and the 20 want the ball. Give me the ball and let me do something with it. So that leads into Murph's point about Conor Whelan being isolated. Like, he always wants the ball. He wants every single ball. If there was 50 deliveries to the full forward line, he wants the 50 of them. That's just the measure of the man, let's say. That's why he, he's, he's so good, and he doesn't let out that handy either. Some of our other players, I'd say, sometimes would be happy to get the pop-off pass, you know, to be given the ball as opposed to go get it. Like, our mindset sometimes with some of, some of our players would be that, as simple as when we don't have the ball, we try to get it back. It's not that. Even if we don't have the ball, you know, try to get it back, obviously. But when we do have the ball, can I create an opportunity for my teammate? Can I do something for him? Do you know what I mean? Even though I don't have the ball, can I do something that will give him an easier pass or give him an easier, you know, out or if he's under pressure? That's what I want to see Galway doing. And if they do that, the shots then will come easier. Do you know what I mean? So it's easier for us to pinpoint shots and say, will they score more? But we have to collectively make it easier for each other. Do you know what I mean? Like shared affordances. You've often heard me talk about that. So like if we have a, a Johnny Cohn coming through the middle, we can't be just looking at him run into a green wall we have got to be making runs left right and centre to create an opportunity and an easy pass for him to get those then create the shots and then easier shots creates more better efficiency like that that's what has to be done against Limerick because if you don't do that you're going to be living off scraps to be honest like you you might get 25 shots in the game and like Limerick are averaging you know the, like I keep saying it 40 to 45 shots so so unfortunately you know what you're going to concede <laughs> you know what I mean or close to it so now you've got to make it happen up front and a key line for us I think is our half forward line so if Limerick as I said last week they're probably going to push up and our puck out so we, we're going to have to have our guys win the ball and that's dirty ball like that's one on one ball man v man and I will say this the Kinney style do you know win your own ball first first of all don't be giving out about the style of ball at the minute just go up and get the feckin thing and once you can maintain possession then work together so the half forward line are absolutely crucial on a, an attacking perspective and from a defensive perspective we don't want Jimmy Burns hitting long frees or, or long, long range points 
that treats it as a bit of a inspiration to Limerick Krause who want to kind of nullify all their big items their big players with their big plays and then go back to the field in you want Dahi Burke uh, I, I wish we had two of them <laughs> I wish we had two of them put one on Galen and one on Flanagan do you know what I mean it's hard to know you put them on Galen Flanagan could pop up with a hip of points you put them on Flanagan Galen hops up with two three do you know what I mean so it's a tricky one so I, I know I give you a roundabout answer there Will do you know what I mean but it all it all kind of breeds in to, get, to answer your question if we all work together want the ball work hard off the ball to give us better opportunities our efficiency goes up well, that's where, I guess, James, the collective has to probably make up for the loss of Joe Canning, where, you know, even in those defeats against Limerick, Canning was so prominent uh, within the yeah. fixtures. Like this year, you've got Conor Cooney's got 155, and you've got Joseph Cooney on 217, Conor Whelan on 216, Colin Mannion on 21 points in the championship this year. That's very impressive scoring across four forwards. There's not too many teams are going yeah. to be sharing the scoring around, you know, as kind of equally as Galway have been able to do this year. But it's one thing when you come to these big fixtures where Canning is the type of guy who can step up and I hate the phrase, but to be a bit of an X factor in big games like this. Yeah. Yeah, like in, I, I make no bones about, let's say, if we were in a tight spot in the game and I was in the goals, I'd be looking to see, where's Joe? Just throw the ball down top of him. And even even you could give him a 70 30 ball, 70, like which I've done in the past, bad puck out, it's more in favour of the defender, is it him? And he'll still come up and win it. Do you know what I mean? That's If you call that an X factor, fair enough. But you just named off four lads there that have good scores put up in fairness. But we need those four, to, those four guys to score three, four points each minimum, as well as Connor's eight, nine frees. You know what I mean? Like Kenny wrote an article during the week about the free taking. Like that's just that's the job. That's that's part of top level support. Like right? if yes, there's pressure on the free taker, but you're there to do a job. So if you get nine frees in a game of this magnitude at this level, going up against a team of this op- this this opposition, you've got to score them all. That's a given. So you get nine frees. That's nine points. And then we need we need the Conor Whelan's. And I know I keep reiterating this, the Conor Cooney's, Conor Whelan, Joseph Cooney, they have to get three, four points each. They just have to get it because we need it to, to, to beat Limerick, you know. And like, there's no sugarcoat in this. We are up against it and we're going to have to score and score pretty well. Our shot efficiency has to be above 65%, if not to 70. Our puck out retention rate has to be up at 65, not 70. We can't be down to 47% again like we were uh, past our own 65. That's just not going to work against Limerick. So there's a lot to do. Can we do it? Yeah, of course we can do it. We can we can do it. And is it, is it going to be an easy task? No, it's not going to be easy. But fuck it. Who wants it easy? Do you know what I mean? Like, can, can you got handy all Ireland's there during the 2000s for nothing, sure, didn't they? Right, that, that's a whole... <laughs> That's a whole different conversation. That's for yeah, an off yeah. week when we can uh, debate this handy all Ireland <laughs> idea that yeah. James there was air quotes there for anyone on the podcast that I was thrown up while I said that. You could set your watch to Limerick, Paul, when it comes to this weekend. As Skella just said, you kind of got to get somewhere between 28 and 32 points if you're going to beat them. Because generally, every game, they tend to hit around about that mark if they're anywhere near their normal quality. And that is so consistent over the last five years when they've got to semi-finals in each of them. They have added a bit more of a goal threat this year, um, with Aaron Galan particularly getting in behind. He got 332 in the championship run to this semi-final. There's no option for Galway, given that we know what Limerick are going to do. The Galway will have to get to around the 30-point mark. There's no option. No, yeah, there's absolutely no option. And there's also the realisation that Limerick can score goals, and if you do shut it down at the back, they'll just pop the ball over the bar and keep the scoreboard going. So it's not a case that you can say, lads, actually, they're... You know, they're shooting from distance isn't great. It's brilliant, you know. So, again, it, it just goes back to the realisation that it just clears the mind. And you just go, well, there's there's nothing, like, there's no point in pretending here that if we shut them down in one area that they're just going to be poor in the other. That's not the case against Limerick. So, for me, anyway, I look at that as not a positive that that's the team we're playing, but a positive for setting the brain. At least I go, okay, no need to, not, like, there's no point in even debating this. We just have to shut them down all over the pitch. Um, like, Galway, it's important for Galway as well to get one or two early scores like Galway don't want this game to drift into the fifth or sixth minute without scoring because that will leave players around the pitch a little bit of doubt maybe you know you can guarantee Limerick will score almost guarantee anyway in the first you know five minutes or so they'll settle into it quick regardless what the team is, is throwing at them um, and again just referencing like I know probably people are sick of talking about 2019 but I'm only trying to draw an experience for against playing against Limerick we got two points I think within the first three minutes um, against Limerick which that really was good for us all over the pitch I think we got a first point within the first minute that's something Galway will look to do as well like it's very important in this game more than any other game where they settle into it very quick get a score on the board reset you know go out maybe win a ball yeah, from the from the next puck out and maybe win a free off it or something like that but just win the next ball win the dirty ball stuff like that are small little victories in a game that are important for Galway and Galway can't just hang their coat on anything in this match to say 
right lads if we shut down Aaron Galan and Flanagan we're halfway there to beating him it's not the case like some people will say and there's a, there's an element of truth in it that you know if, if you hold Tony Kelly fairly scores for Clare you know you'll you'll go a long way to beating Clare and that's that is true in lots of ways and that's no disrespect to Clare but like if if Tony Kelly is capable of going out and scoring 16 points in a game if you do what Wexford did and you know hold him to whatever it was like four points or whatever you know that's 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 a big difference than letting them run around the place and score 16 but Limerick don't have that same thing you can't go out with Seamus Flanagan scoring was it eight points and from play in the Munster final if you keep Seamus Flanagan scoreless at the weekend that, that doesn't really matter because they have so many threats all over the pitch so for each player in the 15 for Galway they just know regardless who I'm marking and I'm going to be marking an all-star most likely I'm going to have to beat him that's it I have to beat him and when I beat him I have to go and help the lad beside me beat his man because that's the only way you can do it. Um, if you give half a yard, like we see what they do with sidelines, if you stand off your man a yard, in any other team you'd nearly say, well, that's grand, I'm, I'm cutting off that player. Not against Limerick. Limerick only need a yard to do anything they want to do. So for, for Galway, that's just, that's where they are. That's what they have to focus on. And like, I don't write Galway off in this game. I actually think if Galway get those things right, they do have players because... One the one element that is going for them is the element of surprise here that a few players could crop up, but they need lots of players really having some of the games of their lives. Like you know, they need your Davy Burke, they need your Dahi Burke, they need your Joseph Cooney, they need your Connor Cooney. Connor, they need them really at the top of their game, and they can do it. I I I do feel like Galway could beat Limerick, but if you're asking me now, Limerick are going to win this match, and I think Limerick will win it by six or eight points at the moment. But I don't I don't think this is a foregone conclusion by any means because. Galway still have the capacity there to go out and possibly overturn Limerick. Paul, we haven't had a chance to mention Keane Lynch whatsoever, but there is that possibility that Keane Lynch comes oh, back geez. in. Again, the talk is, yeah, and I can, I can hear Skelly back in early going, oh great, that's all we need. Uh, potentially, you know, double hurler of the year coming in to uh, come back into the side again. Uh, Colin Neal has, has, look, he's got blooded in brilliantly as it's worked out because Lynch has been unavailable since the start of the second game in the Munster Championship. So there's loads of championship hurling now in Colin O'Neill. But if you're John Kiley, and I know it probably depends on the medical situation and exactly how long he's been back training and how much time he's got in the legs and what's the risk of a reoccurrence when it's a hamstring injury particularly. But you get the green light from the medical team. Is Keen Lynch going straight back in? Absolutely, yeah, 100%. He's, no. he's back in. No, he's not. <laughs> <laughs> Scale, don't worry, John Kiley doesn't listen to this show. Um, no, yeah, 100%. And and you know what? Putting, putting Keen Lynch back in centre-forward doesn't knock a, a funk out of Cahill O'Neill because you know Cahill O'Neill is a competitor and he's an excellent player but Cahill, like Keen Lynch is a generational player like and you just have to have him in the team um, and you know I think any player who loses their position to Keen Lynch if Keen Lynch is fit and you know he ends up starting I don't think there's any player who loses out to Keen Lynch that feels hard done by. You know, it's just you're like if your if your feet are on the ground and you look at this very balanced. I don't think any player loses out. You're, yeah, you're disappointed. You're not starting an All Ireland semi final and so on. But like Keen Lynch has to start if he's fit. He just has to start. He's just that kind of player. And I think if he does start the weekend, I think you know Limerick at times have kind of uh, like the thing I would say about Keen Lynch is that he just pulls all the strings for that Limerick forward line. Like at times they've they've shown. They weren't as fluid as they can be. You know, they sometimes, um, you know, they, they, they take shots from mad positions and so on. What Keane Lynch brings into it is just when he gets the ball, he makes the right decision. He just pops it off, creates a score, takes the score if he needs to himself, but will pop it off. And that counts for a huge amount for Limerick getting scores. So if Keane Lynch comes back in, I think we see this turning back into a, not to say they haven't been a Rolls Royce all year, but I just think they run that bit smoother when Keane Lynch is there. So if he is fit, I don't think there, there's an, it's a no-brainer. John Kiley plays him. But the other thing I will say, if, if, the, if, if the medical team come back and say, he's 90%, I'm not sure. Well, John Kiley, for me anyway, doesn't play him. Because what John Kiley says to the panel is, we're a panel. We have players all over this panel that come in in All-Ireland, and they do. I'd say, hold him back for potentially an All-Ireland final and stick to my guns and play the players that are fit and don't risk further injury in a key and Lynch. But if he gets the green light, he has to start. Yeah, Bob Noonan was asking us on the Instagram as well, if Keane Lynch or Peter Casey are starting, how will they line up and play? And who'd be the two Limerick players that'd be on the bench instead? I think it's very unlikely Peter Casey's going to play given the length of the layoff that he's had. It's very different, uh, James, to 
the idea of Keen Lynch slotting back in that I know he's missed a few weeks of hurling now but it's slightly different when you come back from a muscle injury but you've still had game time in the league and the championship yeah. compared to Casey maybe being like thrown straight in I couldn't see that happen like P- P- Peter Casey's probably <coughs> excuse me been out almost uh, probably 11 months at this stage mm. and uh, I suppose Keane has probably had the opportunity to get a Fitzgibbon Cup campaign behind him get a relatively good league behind him and get into championships so he's in terms of hurling sharpness and I was going to say match fitness but you know what I mean uh, he's ahead of him um, and I think if depending on how the game goes will Keane Lynch start I hope to God he doesn't right but <laughs> will, will, will they feature I think they'll both feature to be honest I think if the game is is uh, not relatively close and Limerick are kind of pulling away put it that way to you. you'll see Peter Casey with a bit of a cameo I'd imagine you know, I'd say he'd probably come in for the last 20 to 30 minutes or who knows if the game is in the middle part he might come in anyways he's just that good of a player too look I, we questioned the, when I personally was was wondering at the start of the year if they lost a player or two how would their squad hold up God like their squad has just got stronger and they've got the best squad in the country at this moment in time in, in you know in, in tandem with Clare so they've got like nearly an embarrassment of riches at this moment in time so will they risk the two buys I, I agree with Murphy in, in the sense that if they're about the 90-95% what do you do you probably don't play them to be honest you're probably hoping or ex- sorry expecting that they come through the semi-final and have them primed in 100% for the final in a couple of weeks uh, but sure like again it's, it's a question of no, it's, it's, it's a question of matchups for Galway <laughs> let's say you take care of you know G- Galan and Flanagan then you've got to pretty well deal with Lynch let's say then you, you just managed to take care of him Oh, you forgot about Gary Chegarty over here. You know, it's just, they have so many good players that even when we're talking about Keane Lynch, someone who is the best hurler in the country in power with Tony Kelly at the moment, that even if he's not on the Limerick team, Limerick are still a superpower. So it's very difficult to say that, that uh, it's very hard for me to sit here and say Limerick absolutely need Keane Lynch. I say it, and I say this with respect, they probably don't at the moment. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? That's how good they are. So I will, will he start, if he's 100% fit, yeah, I agree with Mark, he probably will start, he'll start in there since forward and replace Carl O'Neill who has done really really well and uh, and fitted in seamlessly unfortunately for Galway yeah. <laughs> the scary part of it is they're just lads will stand up on this Limerick team when others are out like imagine if you'd said to someone early in the year well Damon Burns is going to be second top scorer for Limerick this year and he's been like bombing over freeze bombing over points from play Kyle Hayes can play in so many different positions they can move lads around that the first facility is incredible when they have had you know, having to cover in for some of the players that have been unavailable for different times due to suspension and due to injuries. And that's not just big enough Limerick because we're going down there this week because we are going to uh, Dolan's Warehouse on Wednesday. If you want to pick up tickets, there's a link um, which I've tweeted out on my own at Willow Callan. It's also on the Off The Ball Instagram and the Off The Ball of the social pages where you can pick up your tickets. Uh, they're free for Wednesday night. You can come along. Uh, you can see the three of us. Uh, Valerie Wheeler, Wheeler is going to be co-hosting on the night. Uh, we've got Podge Collins, the Claire Jewell player, uh, we've got his first cousin in Jamie Wall who's going to be there too uh, to look forward to the hurling we've got Limerick hurling legend uh, Joe Quaid really enjoyed his Lairica Gale last year he's a guy not just with a great brain for hurling but also you know Camogie and he's going to have some really good stories for us on the night and we're going to have a big panel discussion at the end looking forward to the All-Ireland semi-finals uh, Skell you were in Limerick though at the weekend because I got a tweet from the <laughs> a competition you were at and your club came out on top and apparently you hurled very well. Uh, I got a tweet from one of the organisers saying he should still be playing county. Well, that's a nice compliment. I'll take that. <laughs> we were down in Feddermore GEA yesterday um, and we there was uh, just, a, I think it was in, in the inaugural tournament what they hoped to get going for for years to come and we, we participated in a tournament with Glenn Rovers from Cork, um, Cool Derry from Offaly and uh, Patrick Well there as well from Limerick and it was, I, I thought it was a great tournament the pitch itself is as good a pitch as you see anywhere uh, for, for the, the state it's in it was gorgeous and it was it's the type of pitch that you just you, you'd li- you like to play hurling on and so and like Glenn Rovers was our first game and uh, Patrick Corgan was full forward they didn't rest him or they did not start him so he was there and he was still popping over points and Rob Downey was down at number, at number six so that was a really good game came through through them and then we had Cool Derry in the final which was which was like a, like a championship game so for us as a club it was great to get that type of game with that type of opposition and we came through and look it's nice to win it you go down to do to participate first of all and hope to win and when you come back with both a good participation and, and a bit of a plaque it's, it's a, it was a good day and fair play to Fedmore Was uh, Brian Carroll hurling for Cool Derry? He wasn't no he wasn't there right. um, Kevin Brady was hurling by still going yeah, yeah. going strong yeah Cahill Barlin was going strong so they're a big physical team a bit like ourselves so it was, uh, it was hot and heavy for the first two minutes there was a few verbals being exchanged and I wasn't involved <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I wasn't involved <laughs> 
Yeah, it's good. Good to see some of those lads would have played in an All Ireland final a decade ago. Now at this point, and still yeah. playing for their club. It was their off week in the uh, Offaly hurling championship, which got underway at the weekend, just gone by. So interesting to see how cool Larry are shaping up for that, uh, getting to the final of the competition. How did Patrick Horgan hurl then? Because you know, there was all this talk about you know where he's been with Cork and been on the bench, and you know whether he has that bit of a kick of pace anymore. How did he play? Well, first things first. When I walk past him, like he's in great shape, he's in great nick. Like so, it's not. It's, it couldn't be a question of fitness or, or fatigue or whatever. He looked in really, really good nick. But he was marking our full back. And I, I always say this, and people might, will, I guarantee 95% of people in, in Galway will disagree with me. Our full back is probably one of the best man markers that I've ever played behind when you, when you think of Dottie Brooks. So he did, he did really good in Patrick Argonau. It was obvious Glen Rovers that their type of game was to, to get the ball to hockey. Of course, that's the type of game because he got the premier forward in their team. Um, but he still rattled over eight or nine points at a match. I think he got three or four from play and struck his freeze. Um, the halves were short there were 20 minutes a half because it was all in the one day so he probably didn't get as much ball or as much opportunity to score as he'd like but man he was still sharp like Jesus he was a week away from playing with Cork you know the week gone and like, he was still looking moving fierce well touch was excellent so it just reaffirms the point how did he not start last week <laughs> with respect with respect of course yeah how did he not start but uh, he did good but our full back did good them too so credit where credit is due Paul, when it comes to cameos, we just mentioned cameos there a second ago. Owen O'Donnell, I was watching him at Crow Park in the quarterfinals on the Saturday. Came on, did reasonably well for the Dublin footballers. I was intrigued to see where he was going to go because my first thought was because of Conor Callan's injury and because he plays wing forward for his club, I thought he might push in close on the Cork back line because Cork, even when they were well behind, I think they were about nine or ten points behind when he came on, were still deploying powder as a sweeper at that point and they were still playing very deep I was wondering if maybe they might put him in as a physical presence instead he came on effectively as a sweeper himself in the wing back line for Dublin made a couple of blocks he assisted a score uh, definitely didn't do any damage of his chances of getting on in an upcoming All-Ireland semi-final against Kerry my only thought though when we look at it from a hurling perspective if he goes well and say if they're impressed with how he plays Desi Farrell next year will probably look to get him in with the footballers straight away start of the year and if he's attracted to that that potentially could be a huge blow for the Dublin hurlers into 2023. Yeah, it could be a huge blow. And, it, you know, look, I mean, he has to do what's good for him as well. Um, if there's a chance there, he could go win an All-Ireland medal. Um, like, Because obviously the chance is a lot higher with the Dublin footballers than it is with the hurlers. Um, you know, you have to kind of respect that as well. And he's given great service so far to the Dublin hurlers. But there's, look, I suppose there's lots of... There's a long way to go before they figure out what he's going to do next year. And say there's a lot way to figure out for Owen O'Donnell himself what he's going to do next year. But certainly, I think at this day and age, if he does decide he's going with the footballers, I don't think um, there's scope anymore for him to go with the hurlers or or for it to be of a benefit. You know, maybe like they do need him. They do need him there. Um, and it'd be, a, it'd be a big setback for the hurlers if he's not there. But can, could he do both? Um he might be able to do it for one year or two years, but I, do, I think he's doing himself a disservice nearly at this stage to, to try and compete with both. Um, but it, it would be certainly a big loss, and certainly for where Dublin are now and trying to build going forward, like he would be the foundations of that going forward. Uh, and if he goes to the football, like that puts them back a, a nice bit. And trying, I don't think they can replace him really, you know, like for like. Um, Owen O'Donnell realistically in any other county in Ireland will get on the team you know and, yeah. I, and I actually include Limerick in that as well I think if he played again even with a, in a higher standard team of the likes of Limerick I think we, he flourishes and we see more of him again so like that's the type of player he is so for Dublin to have him it's brilliant but for if he picks the football next year um, which again look he mightn't you, you, lot, lot can happen between now and then um, it, it'd be a real setback for the Dublin hurlers but yeah. like, what, what does it say to the rest of the hurling team though what does it say like if you're he's your captain isn't he at the moment yeah what does it say if your captain steps away and joins the footballers like what for like for I won't say up and coming hurlers but like the guys who are 19, 20 like what does that say if they have a choice to make because I think there's an awful lot of dual players in, in Dublin at the moment playing with their clubs like are they all going to go the opposite way of the football I think it does bigger damage uh, than people might realise so mm. if I'm not, not even the Dublin manager or the coach if I'm the Dublin hurling chairman or whoever and doing everything I can to keep holding on Every, everything you can because Murphy, you're 100% right. He is one of the premier full backs in the country. Right up there. Top three, 100%. So, like, he, it's imperative that you keep him. It's different when you lose a player who's probably on and off a squad, you know. But if you lose, like, someone as important and, and, and as effective as Owen Donnell, it's detrimental to your team. So, they need to do whatever they can to keep that man with hurling his hands. It's interesting to get your perspective on that from a hurling point of view because I was chatting to Michael Quinlivan 
on our GA late night on the off the ball Twitter spaces last night and he was looking at it from the football perspective and his thought was that this year might be slightly different because of the injuries that Dublin have had and because of players who've retired that he's coming in almost to expand out the panel because of the circumstances of Dublin being knocked out in the hurling but Quinn Living was saying that if he was a Dublin footballer at the start of next year it would feel different to him, James, than a player being parachuted in because of requirement this summer. Yeah. That you would have to commit to it at the start of the year because they wouldn't be happy with the idea of him going off to hurl for the league and the round robin and then parachuting in again next summer. A yeah. decision would have to be made for early, early next year. As you say, because it would probably annoy one camp or the other or maybe both yeah. if you try and mix it up. But the uh, thing as well, and I, again, this sounds bad, but I think it's 100% true and you won't change my opinion. A hurler can go through a season finish the season and then hop into the football team a football player can't do that in hurling you can't go through all your football season and then hop into the hurling it's just at a level where the hurling sharpness you just don't get it do you know what I mean whereas if you finish a hurling season you'll have your fitness you'll have your match fitness and you can probably hop into it as we've seen right now with Roland Allen but if it's to flip around I don't think it works so if he does commit to the Dublin footballers and you'd imagine again with respect the Dublin footballers will outlast the hurlers in the championship so I don't think he'd get the opportunity to do the reverse so that's why he has to be with the hurlers first and foremost. I, I think, like, I, I'd, I'm not even from Dublin, but I would, ha- I would hate to see it uh, for a county who you want to be competing against the big teams for a player of his prominence to be doing that. So keep him, get him, do what you have to do. <laughs> do what you have to do to keep that man with a hurl in his hand, financially, so whatever you have to do, keep that man. Slightly mafioso there, the idea of ensuring that he's going to play. <laughs> mafioso, oh, give, yeah. give him an offer he can't refuse. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, by the way, if uh, any of our listeners here on the Hurling Pod uh, want to tune in to GA Late Night, it's half past eight next week where our focus is going to be almost 100% on the games that will have taken place in the Hurling semi-finals at the weekend. And all you have to do is just go on to uh, Off The Ball's Twitter, just put up your hand to say you want to come in on the chat and you can come in. I might even be able to uh, coax these two boys to come on uh, for a bit of a cameo within the chat itself next Sunday. So looking forward to that. You can pick it up in the podcast on the OTB uh, GA feed afterwards as well. Uh, before we go back and double back on to the Clare against Kilkenny game let's get you both on the record here because people love to go what was the prediction that they both made so they can give you a hassle next week James give me your prediction for Limerick against Galway on Sunday uh, my heart is obviously Galway but my head just when I look at the matchups I, I, it's it's a very difficult proposition I think Limerick are going to come out on top Morph said probably six or eight points in your own yeah. opinion uh, and like it's 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 very hard for me to argue because I'm, I'm trying to make a case for Galway that's me, that the case I'm making for Galway is that everything has to go right, you know. And like nine times out of ten in games, that doesn't happen, and especially against Limerick. So my heart says Galway, but my head is saying Limerick, unfortunately. And Murph, I'm not slandering you by saying six to eight points to Limerick is your prediction. Yeah, that's what I'm going with. Like this, this Limerick team, we said I said it a few weeks ago. You know, when we referred to other teams potentially like Wexford meeting Limerick at this stage, compared to Wexford beating Limerick down in Wexford Park, Limerick and Crow Park are capable of opening up any team that's the bottom line whether it's Galway whether you know whoever it is so there's lots of possibilities here I'm just saying at the moment I do fancy that Galway will come at this game and give it a serious rattle and I don't write off Galway at all you know I do think that they have the capabilities um, and I do think you know you saw the reaction after the last game uh, in the quarter final, like when they won it, okay, they won it by a point. wasn't glamorous at all, but they seem to be a really there. Just seems to be a really good spirit in that bunch there. Like the lads coming over to Henry Shefflin, Dahi Burke coming over, giving him a hug. You know, see the reaction of Davy Burke on the bench and stuff. Like it was just, you know, there seemed to be a really good spirit there in that team. And I think they're going to give it a really good crack. It's just, it's it. It just seems at the moment um, a step too far. And I, yeah, I do think Limerick by about six or eight points, but that's. No disrespect to Galway at the moment. Um, I just it, it it's more credit to Limerick and where they are. I just think that sounds about right to me. Six or eight points, but there's a lot can happen this weekend. Okay, let's open the floor, Paul. You can start Clare against Kilkenny. We already talked about you know how Kilkenny will probably be relishing the idea of coming in under the radar and trying to beat a Clare team who've been you know praised pretty much across the board for how they've played in the championship. We've spoken about Kilkenny a good few times in recent weeks and going into the Leinster final, and we weren't quite sure what's the best fifteen. Do you think that Cody and his backroom team know exactly where they're going selection-wise into this weekend then? Yeah, I think the way they're going at this, like the, the, the narrative before the other games were Kilkenny, let's say before the Wexford game, that Kilkenny had changed it up quite a bit. They changed it up four changes against Dublin, you know, a few more changes against Wexford. Um, and, and people were kind of saying Kilkenny don't know their, their 15. But I think for this match, it's different. Kilkenny are going to go with a 15 where they think they can really target Clare and where do I think they're going to target Clare 
obviously the full back line you know they've got the warning now that the full back line don't like you know the ball coming in high they got you know giving away the goals they gave away against Wexford you don't just get rid of that overnight they can deal with it certainly but that's that's a message to Kilkenny that if you get in there and get a physical full forward line so I expect Kilkenny to come with a physical full forward line what that'll be uh, I'm not sure but I expect it to be something along the lines of you know Owen Cody Mossy Keown and TJ Reid Walter Welch could be in full forward either I expect him to you know to anchor that full back line in at the full back line I think Kilkenny will go with someone to drag John Conlon out of the centre back position because again you see where Jack O'Connor got the goal against Wexford you know he pulled um, Conlon out of that centre back position and what John Conlon you know again like Keane Lynch with Limerick John Conlon pulls a few strings there when he's at centre back kind of a Declan Hannon job as well you know he moves the ball really well he gets on ball good at getting on breaking ball and moving it out of trouble and getting clear on the attack so I think someone might pop up at centre forward that we maybe haven't seen at centre forward and it'll just give Clare and Brian Lowen a question for maybe 10 or 15 minutes what, what are they doing here should we go and follow him should we leave him but they'll try and drag him it could be Adrian Mullen I think because Adrian Mullen's good at moving around uh, let's say the midfield area and just maybe making John Conlon step up that small bit but where, where I think the Kenny then have to go then is they have to decide I think they go man mark and Tony Kelly I think they just take out that problem anytime who, who man marks him then I think Mikey Butler goes a man marks him. I think he's capable of doing it. He went after Cahill Mannion the last day and what it showed to me was that there was no fear of where Mikey Butler might end up on, on the pitch. Like he, he picked up a ball, I think, at centre forward at one stage. Um, I think he got fouled up there another time. And I think he's capable of just running up the pitch freely in terms of following Tony Kelly. And if a ball breaks, he can get involved then as well. I could be wrong. I could, they might be looking some other way. They might be looking Paddy Deegan, who has absolutely savage running, which, you know... Obviously, people can see that there, but like, I've been in fitness with Paddy Deegan over the years, and he's a, he's an incredible athlete. So they have to match Tony Kelly on a foot race as well. So I think uh, my heart is saying they'll go with Mikey Butler to follow him um, and try and just do a job similar enough to what Wexford did. You know, stay keep tabs on him, and if you're not involved in the game, fine. But as long as Tony Kelly is involved, and the last place then I think Kilkenny will target is they'll have a look at the clear wing backs going up the line. You know. Um, they look at the lads you know five and seven position they attack up the wings and yeah. they, they pop up with scores but if you turn them over there's an enormous space there that can be attacked into and like I said against Galway you know Parik Mannion uh, and Finta Burke wanted to sit back and Kilkenny said that's grand you sit back we're going to sit off you and we're going to sit up in the 65 and Kilkenny got a few handy scores off it and they just made Galway answer the question of what you're going to do there I think similarly they'll actually flip that now so if they turn over Clare while Clare are boot, booting up those channels well then they'll tell lads listen occupy that space that space will be free get the ball into that space and now suddenly we have forwards on the ball one on one with their own men um, and get the runners off the shoulder then I think that's the way Kilkenny will go but that's like you know at the end of the day that's all talk Clare will have their own game plan for Kilkenny and Clare will look at Kilkenny and say right lads we're going to have to go and try and target these lads as well and they're in a really good place at the moment and if, if like those wing backs bombing up the line could be Kilkenny's positive if they turn them over but if Clare start getting a few scores there you know it's, an, it's a positive for Clare and, and you know they, they start building momentum into the game so it's again like we said it's finely balanced this game and they're, they're the battles for me that have to be won and what will decide who comes out of here in an all Ireland final after the weekend mm. James on the selection decision um, Craig Lee 2002 was in contact on Instagram and the question is simple, Nolan or Hayes? Uh, given that Hayes got the curly finger during the last game pretty early, which way do you start cornerback okay. position? Because we've been talking about how good Hayes has been all year. Yeah, we, we have. Um, but we're talking how good he was up to a point now. In fairness to the kid, like, he's done fierce well, right? But he uh, he started off the championship fantastic. He was really, really impressive in the first kind of you know, the Limerick game. But then when he played Waterford and he played Limerick recently, like he's been taken for 114. Yeah, I don't mean that in a disrespectful manner. That's just the reality. Desi Hutchinson got one six, didn't he? He did. And Flanagan got eight points. And I don't think he was moved off Flanagan. So it's his form has dipped a bit. And I think the uh, the issue with him coming off the last day was probably more, I don't think it was injury-based. I think it was probably more off the field by, by all accounts, let's say. So I'm thinking, God, every, every finger is pointing towards Nolan. But it just depends. Like From what I gathered and clear, Brian Lohan is a really, really good man manager. He's a really good guy to kind of have the players around him and kind of getting them to tick all their own boxes. So my head is telling me that he's going to start Rory Hayes, that look, what he did in the last couple of weeks is just a blip. Just a blip and just park it and move on, let's say. And if Rory Hayes is right and tuned in, let's say, he's, he's, a, he's a supreme operator, a confident operator. So I'm probably going to say Hayes is going to go in there. Um, 
because they're going to that that line is going to come under awful pressure. I fully agree with Murph. I think the key man for me for Kilkenny and all this. I know it's easy to say who's going to match Tony Kelly, but Adrian Mullen I think is going to make an awful lot of tick here if he can get on the ball at midfield and somehow just suck out the the uh, I suppose if you're going to call it the clear half back line a bit and create a bit of space inside the likes of Owen Cody and Mossy Keown. And I would put TJ. I wouldn't put TJ in the middle third. I would put him inside. Um, they'll do awful damage. Like Kilkenny have scored 14 goals in the group stages. Uh, like of, of the round robin and like they've only conceded four so they've got a good defence when it comes to goal defence obviously and they've got a good attack so they're going to need goals as well to take over clear just like Galway need goals against Limerick Kikini are going to need goals too so like 14 goals in, in, in five games under, that's a really good return almost an average of three so I think we'll be seeing them lads going for the going for the juggler early on too um, like you're, you're Mikey Butler there Murph like is mm. yeah is, will Richie Lachie play? Yeah, he could. Um, he could play, but are you talking in terms of him marking Tony Kelly? Just uh, yeah, because Michael Butler has been ex- for me. He's been really. I, w- I will. I will say excellent. He's been excellent from what he's been tasked to do. He's really good in the full back line. Excellent in yeah. terms of marking the Premier, you know, corner forward if you like. I was thinking just myself, Mikey Butler on Shane O'Donnell, mm. and could Richie Lahey or this probably sounds outrageous an Alan Murphy type lad keep up with Tony Kelly and mark him? Absolutely, and I think yeah. the, the man you said there, I'd, I'd, I'd more go for a kind of an Alan Murphy type job there because, like Richie Lahey, I suppose if, if you're saying if a player is a more attack minded or defensive minded, Richie Lahey's more attack minded. Similar enough with Alan Murphy, but Alan Murphy yeah. does a great job for his club then more in terms of getting back, winning dirty ball, and that's something you have to consider as well. Is that okay? You're going to mark Tony Kelly, but if the opportunity arises and there, and a ruck arrives, who? can get into that ruck and potentially win the ball and get it out Alan Murphy has this he's really adept at winning the ball in a ruck and something that's not picked up on but just coming out with it getting in rising it turning and popping it off so yeah absolutely Alan Murphy Alan Murphy could do a job there because yeah. um, Murphy as well with Murphy I was thinking because a lot of the ball Kelly people see Kelly he gets it in the Kikini half but he, he, he also picks up a lot of ball in his own half Yeah. So if, if Alan Murphy's marking him Alan Murphy's a shooter as well he's yeah. a free checker so he's accurate if the ball falls to him you know yeah. what's going, what's going yeah. over the bar as well. Well, what I will say is again, like you know, we we played the lads have Brian and the lads are really good at picking out man or yeah matchups really. Like sometimes over the years we would have just picked a man and you knew the man you were going to have three or four days out regardless what happened. And that was including if if I'm number two but I'm playing centre back, that's fine. Play centre back. You're and there was never any rules about that about being out of position. So the 2014 final. You know, I was moved on to Bonner Mar after about 15 minutes, I'd say, in the first match, and marked him for the whole game. And I, like, I felt really good after the game that we had a good battle, but that I did the job I was meant to do. So coming into the final, the replay, then I was going, okay, I'm probably going to be marking Bonner Mar. And I said it openly to Brian. I said, I'll go for Bonner Mar again because, you know, I really felt that he was such an important player that I relished that. I think Mikey Butler looks at things very similar that way. Um, but they came out, they said, no, Kieran Joyce, you're going Bonner Mar, and I was going Larry Corbett. And I, at the time, I was going. I kind of thought about it for a few seconds as to Jesus I thought I did a good job the last day right but I'll go on and mark Larry Corbett the boys had obviously just sat down and said whatever way they had trashed it out and we got the matchups really well right that day so I'm not surprised I'm saying Mikey Butler now but like you said I'm not surprised if they come in and say listen Alan Murphy or Paddy Deegan you're actually going out here and you're going to or Tommy Walsh Tommy Walsh you're going out there marking him Conor Delaney could be in they, whatever way they look at it I I think Brian could get it really right this weekend, um, but at the same time, Tony Kelly could turn up on Saturday evening and shoot the lights out. Sixteen so, points again. <laughs> like, the scoreboard could be broken on Saturday evening with Tony Kelly. Like no, but in, in seriousness, oh, I do think Kilkenny have options there to go out and mark him. And I just look in the current form. We're talking about current form. Mikey Butler has just proved to be tigerish over the last while. I know I've talked about him a lot, but he just seems to be tigerish. And I'm looking for a fellow who would relish the idea of going out and maybe not even holding a ball in his hand for the 70 minutes. But if you do a job for the team that's really selfless and and stick to Tony Kelly, in my mind, the man for that is Mikey Butler. But okay. we'll wait till we see when the ball is thrown in and who goes after who Saturday evening to, to see what, Kilkenny, what, what Brian Cody has thought of that. Right. How strongly do you debate that then? So you get the word then from, I'm guessing, Cody, Dempsey, Fogarty, you're telling you, look, you're going in and you're going to move off Mar and you're going to cross on Lar. How strongly do you even fight the case and say, well, actually, no, I think I'd be better to stick on Bonner again? Or do you just accept their decision? How much of a debate is there? 
Did you say debate and Brian Cody in the same sentence there? Yeah. <laughs> this sort of zero, this sort of yeah. zero debate. No, no, look, my, my, my thing first was, and it wasn't a case that I was not argumentative, or no, not argumentative isn't the right word, but like, you know, that you wouldn't air your opinion. Um, I remember Brian came to me and he kind of laughed because I said it in a meeting before that I'll take Bonner Marr, like, you know, <laughs> kind of in the team, the blood was up. And I said, look, I'll go for Bonner. Um, and that's full respect to Bonner. He's a great player and great battles with him over the years. But, uh, you know, Brian came to me and he said, listen, he kind of went to the lads individually and said, listen, you're going to be taking that. And he came over to me and he said, listen, you're, you're going to be taking Larry. And he kind of laughed. He said, I know you wanted to go Mark Bonner, but you're going Mark and Larry. And he said, out of that, he said, that's, like, again, that's a tip of the hat to you as well. Like, he said, don't take that because Bonner Mar is in flying form that, you know, we think you're not capable of doing it. It was more a case, he said, listen, take that as a tip of the hat that we think Bonner, that we think Larry is, is dangerous and, you know, we want someone to go and mark him. So, why you know, why, did, why did he say that, Murph? Why, why did he put you on there? Did, 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 did. Uh, I just think he saw Lar like I think in in that game I think in the first match I think Lar hit the ball off the post I think in, in like you know he popped up in one or two places and he looked like he could have like he could have came away with maybe one one or one two or something like this like Lar was always a player that we kind of acknowledged that you know when there was a rook going on you might have owned Kelly it's, and Bonner Mar in the middle of it but Lar steps away and oh, that's dangerous if you so lose harsh. your concentration and you watch the ball and some players are really good at it like Henry was really good as well that he notices when his man marker has is now watching the ball and he gets away from you creates I'm not even talking 10 yards of space 20, 30 yards and suddenly now Lar was like excellent at that so the boys wanted to make sure that you know they knew I was probably full of fire for that game that listen, you're going to mark Lar and keep your focus on Lar. And if you don't hold the ball, fine, but stay focused on him. So that's really it. They just decided who do we think, like for like, who do you think is going to mark who here? And they got the matchups right. So you can't, you know, Kieran Joyce came out of that game, man of the match. So like that's justification for their decision. But it wasn't a case that you questioned and go, why did you do that? I feel hard done by here. You just go, brilliant. Because they had such a great forward. You weren't you weren't insulted at any stage as to yeah. who you were marking, you know. But the reason so. I asked the question is because like, obviously you had Jackie on there for a couple of occasions. You had Tommy on there. Mm. So why, why is it... Lara and Tommy. Was, Lara Lara and Tommy. Tommy yeah. <laughs> Sorry, my apologies. Lara and Tommy. Yeah. So the question is, did he... Was it... Was he looking at the six forwards and chipping, trying to pick them out individually? Or was it like you were always there? You weren't always there. So I'm mm. interested to know why did he pick you there? I time. think I think they just saw what the roles were for the tip forwards that time that they maybe Lars' role had changed from the 2011 final let's say where, where Jackie picked him up that he sat a bit deeper he kind of roamed out a little bit more in 2014 and I think they were saying, saying listen Jackie and JJ you stay a little bit not that they stay closer to the goal the boys found themselves out around the middle plenty of times but they just saw I suppose Lar Rome in that small bit and I don't know I was never explained why it really happened but afterwards that was kind of my own justification that I just saw him out around the middle a small bit and maybe if I picked up the ball there um, look obviously JJ Delaney and Jackie Tyrrell are holding the fort there that I can pop it off or whatever like this so that to me was the only thinking um, I don't think there was that much more to it but I took it as a compliment it was great great to mark a man like him mm. Right, let's get some predictions then on this game on Saturday. It's the first uh, game of the two, half past five on Saturday evening at Crow Park. James, as the perfect neutral on this one, who's going through, Kilkenny or Clare? Um, well, my, my initial feeling is Clare, but again, I always, how many times in this podcast have I, have I called in Kilkenny by the devils? Right, because you just, you, you know what they're going to bring, and I don't think you're going to see, I, I can't see this Kilkenny Clare game being a real high score and high intensity, I'd see it high intensity for sure, but I don't see it being. 325 to 226 so I've just seen it be more of a dogfight affair there could be a clean sheet on, on either side you know what I mean I think that it'll be it'll be kind of like a, a it won't be a knockout kind of boxing match it'll be a 12 rounder if, if that makes sense you know what I mean um, and I think Akini are going to try bring Clare into that dogfight they don't want Clare to be running angles all around the place they don't want Tony Kelly to be covering 100 yards and scoring a point they're going to try and nullify all that indirectly by playing their own game but they're not going to do that obviously they'll try to put the shackles on Tony Kelly and the big Clare players they put a bit of focus on them, but I think the Kenny will focus on themselves. The intense work rate, the huge kind of dogged attitude that they always bring and see where the game takes them. So weighing all that up, I still do think Clare are probably the second best squad at the moment in Ireland. And I do think they have the, 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 the troops to come in in, the, in kind of the 60, 60 minutes, 65 minutes, you know, that you'll kind of finish off a game. So I'm going to go Clare, but I'm only going to go by the minimum. I'm, I'm only going to say a point, two points max. Um, and equally I could sit here now next Monday morning and Kilkenny could have won the game by a point or two points it's just ter- terribly hard to call so I'm going to say Clare by one to two Right Murph go on 
Yeah, I'm going to go Kilkenny. <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> what changed? Jeez, <laughs> uh, I don't know what changed there. I know. Look, there's a good few games this year now where, um, where you know, I, I I backed against Kilkenny when I felt you know it, it'd be stupid to be you know going with the heart or anything like that. But you know, I, I have experience from beating semi-finals and seeing the way the lads prepare and. Um, I just I like the position they're in coming into the game. You know, I like them not having an extra match. Um, I like them having seen enough of Clare this year to say that they have enough there to target Clare. Like I think I don't know where it's coming from. You like you get these hunches as to what way do you think the game is going to go. But I do think they'll get their matchups right. And I think the likes of Owen Cody, for me, the likes of Owen Cody could have a really good game because you know looking at, against Galway, once or twice he was just just Galway were just a little bit cute and shutting him down you know he had a chance he's in on the breaks he could have got a goal against Galway the ball that broke around the box on Cody's in on top of these balls and after looking at the Wexford game you know the fact that maybe the bit of physicality in the full forward line could, could cause problems I, I think it's made for the likes of on Cody to step up and have a really good game not step up he's had great games all year but maybe get a goal and you know a goal and four points or something like this um, I think Kenny will get the matchups right the only way I will say that I think Kenny might like, and I'll go back to the Cork semi-final last year it's just that introducing the substitutes and getting the right substitutes on the pitch let's say whatever way the game is developing bringing the right players on at the right time that's the only way I'd say that Kilkenny could mm. maybe get it wrong that's that's where I'm thinking because I saw it against you look at the Cork match last year you know Kilkenny started really well but then once you know Cork were going well and even in extra time like Bring, they brought back on Mossy Keown when they had taken him off and I would have thought it was a good time for Richie Hogan to get on with about 10 or 15 minutes to go I felt that the decisions when they brought on players weren't wasn't the right player at the right time and that's not against the players it's against what Kilkenny needed so for me I think Kilkenny will get the matchups right um, and I, I do think they'll win by I think they'll win by three points uh but it's a tight game, and like you, like you said, like it, and it's not a get out clause. Like you said, sitting here Monday morning, like I hold my hands up and I say, Clare could win this by six if they get the momentum going, if they get Hill sixteen rocking with their supporters. You know they're very capable, and if Tony Kelly, if Tony Kelly gets a run, you know there's lots of things can happen. But my head and my heart are saying Kenny will win this by two or three. All right, for something totally away from the games of the weekend, and I'm gonna have to do my team first because I didn't prep the two boys for this at all. Call Mac seventy nine on Instagram has given us an idea and I think the football pod did this a few weeks ago so why not follow suit uh, get the lads to pick their best five aside team of current players so you can have a goalkeeper two defenders and two forwards I agonised about this earlier today because I wasn't quite sure what way to get the composition right so uh, you, do you go for defenders who are going to be tight markers on the two forwards at the other end do you go for guys who are going to get forward and will be able to transition the ball do you want forwards who can also drop back into midfield? I think you need someone who can do a little bit of everything within the team. So the five players that I've picked, while well, the lads can scribble down their ideas, and this isn't an easy thing to do. Thanks a lot, Jesus. Carl Mack. Right, so I'm going to put Owen Murphy in goal because of his distribution, because I think he's the best goalkeeper in the game right now anyway. So for me, he's a mm. lock. Then I've decided to... I agonised about this one because I thought maybe Park Welsh might be another player who's very well suited to play in this position I'm going to put two Limerick lads into my defence and that's going to be Dermot Burns and Kyle Hayes I have another Limerick player and I know Skehl is going to say this before I put him in he'll say is this if the game was tomorrow <laughs> Keen Lynch in here and I don't care if Keen Lynch is still coming back from injury he's objection starting. your honour objection your honour <laughs> object away to, to me Keen Lynch yeah. we're, we're doing this as in if lads are available yeah. and fit and firing ready to go and I put Tony Kelly beside him I think that to me that five aside team has got the balance that I need and I'm confident in go out and take on your team so <laughs> Mr Murphy give us your team <laughs> the, no, the, yeah. the balance that I need he says that's outright <laughs> firepower right there I'm, I'm only going to I'm only going to say one honourable mention before I name my team I okay. debated hard with Park Welch like you said Will just because I think he's an all around player and I think he would do a job the way I'm looking at it is yeah you need players who can do everything going forward and defending uh, Owen Murphy on the goal Again, dear Burns. The other player I went for, which I know you won't have, I don't think so, but I just think, and he's an ex-forward, he's a Limerick man, ex-forward, and I just think he's absolutely excellent all year and doesn't get the credit, Barry Nash. I think Barry oh, yeah. Nash is an incredible player. Um, and he does everything so well, even when Limerick aren't firing on all cylinders. Barry Nash is there getting involved, getting blocks in, getting hooks in. And you see him popping up then from corner back, getting scores at really important times. So at the moment, I, I couldn't not have Barry Nash in the team. Uh, and in Keane Lynch and Tony Kelly yeah so they're, they're fairly obvious 
The, the other honourable mention before I bring Skell in, I did think about Tyg de Burke as potentially one of my defenders too, as a guy who can move the ball around in his distribution, but I, I went for Hayes ahead of him. But I had Tyg de Burke in the tall process as well. Skell, you're going to throw something totally left field here, I've no doubt. I am, yeah. Because he, he all went with the safe bets, didn't he? Yeah. yeah. Joe Quaid in the goal, is it? <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Skell, you're going to go mad here now. <laughs> Joe Cunningham in goal. Right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm actually going to... Yeah, I will. Yeah, I'm going to name a team that'll take on your teams. Go on. <sighs> Nicky Quaid and goals. Okay. Shot stopping is fantastic. Uh, played out field for his club, Effin. So in, ter- in terms of his ball skills, no problem at all. Mm-hmm. I'm going to go for Dahi Burke. He's a machine, as you see with Carfin, up and down the pitch. And he can throw a good few fair shoulders every now and then. Um, so he'll be a great defender to have. I'm going to go Sean Finn. Again, he, uh, for a man his size, how he moves at the pace he does. Is beyond me. I don't think you have to explain Sean Finn now to be fair. <laughs> Never to justify that. <laughs> Thank you, okay. Yeah, uh, then the forwards, I'm going to go Conor Whelan. Again, he's perfect for five aside. He'll score when he wants to score and he'll, he'll, he'll defend like a like a mofo. He's not, like he's just class at that. The fifth one then, I'm going to go Shane O'Donnell. He's terribly elusive. Extremely elusive. Uh, and he'd be ideal for that kind of game, I think. So, would you... Yeah... Yeah, we'll take, we take on your lads, yeah. The pick of them. The pick of them. We'll take on the pick of your lads. <laughs> I, I was intrigued, James, because when I heard Whelan go in as your first forward, I was thinking, right, one of Keane Lynch or Tony Kelly is going to be left out. You're going to get pelters from the Clare fans if you leave Tony Kelly out again. Sure, Tony you Kelly isn't in his top 20. He doesn't, like, doesn't, top five, look, not a chance for... Look, lads, to be honest, right, and I said it before, and it's an admission... I bloody well forgot about Tony Kelly, right? Okay. <laughs> All right. And the minute you said his name, my jaw dropped and I went, oh shit, I'm after forgetting Tony yeah, Kelly. Yeah. But I'm so thick and ignorant, I had to keep going with it. All right. But now... <laughs> to be my, fair, Skell, you didn't go your, your best five and then... An honourable mention, 23 players honourable mention. Like That's usually what you go with, just to cover all, just to cover everybody. So fair play to you, you've, you've matured. No, but if I was picking the best five, obviously Lynch and Kelly are in it, but I'm picking the five to take on your list. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, yeah that's fair. Right. Now, Tony Kelly, just the 150 this year after he was forgotten about earlier this season. So. And we might, uh, yeah, we, we, we put in David Fitz as the manager just to psych them up. <laughs> <laughs> right, Skell doesn't even get to manage his own five-a-side team. I'm looking no. forward to uh, being back with the lads on Wednesday. We're going to be in Dolan's Warehouse. If you're around Limerick, you want to pick up tickets, uh, just have a quick look on OTB social pages. They are free. You just have to register your name to go along in the night there's going to be plenty of hurling chat uh, with the lads we're also looking forward to talking to Jamie Wall to Joe Quaid um, to Podge Collins on the night it's going to be a fantastic evening of crack ahead of the semi-finals this weekend we'll be back of course for episode 20 a very important number for us uh, the All-Ireland semi-final review will be next Monday you can pick it up on the hurling feed pod at around about 7pm depending on how long it takes uh, to do the debrief of next weekend semi-finals and we'll also begin our build up uh, pretty much straight away for the All-Ireland final YouTube uh, 10 o'clock just after off the ball finishes each uh, Tuesday night is the best place to get us on YouTube it's a great place to have the chat have the interaction is in the comments in the YouTube too uh, by all means send us some abuse along the way on Twitter as well we look forward to your thoughts on the semi-finals next week but for now Paul Murphy James Gell thanks a million sound lads good luck